Cross-site scripting is the most common vulnerability type paid out on HackerOne. Over $4 million has been given out for this vulnerability type alone. It's the most common vulnerability type on bug bounty platforms by far, so you'd expect it to be used in the wild by hackers all the time. But that's actually not what we see. The Verizon Breach Report is a report put out by Verizon every year that analyzes the most common root causes for breaches. Even within the category of basic web application attacks, by far the most common cause in this category is stolen credentials. Cross-site scripting might take up a subset of the subcategory exploit vuln, but cross-site scripting itself doesn't actually show up in the 100 plus page report. So why do we have this discrepancy? Let's dig into a real world example where cross-site scripting was used in the wild to attack someone and try to figure out why it's not so common. Before we do that, a quick overview on what cross-site scripting actually is. Cross-site scripting is when a user input accidentally gets rendered as HTML or JavaScript. It's infamously tested with the iconic script alert one string, which is often painstakingly pasted into every input field on the entire website, with the attacker hoping to see that iconic pop-up window, signaling their input caused a little bit of mischievous JavaScript to run on the website. From that point, the attacker just has to modify that JavaScript to do something malicious, and then get it to execute on a victim's browser. Sometimes that's through a reflected input in a URL by getting a victim to click a link, and sometimes that's through a stored input by just having a victim browse to the malicious input. Recently, an attack against UPS users took advantage of a reflected cross-site scripting in the URL. The attacker actually braggadociously hit a message in the URL for future security analysts to find, which included a smiley winky face. And then they included malicious JavaScript in the URL that redresses the UPS website when you click on the link. The purpose of the UI redressing is to have the UPS website serve a Word document that executes malware on the victim system when macros are enabled. The document is crafted in a way that makes the user think they need to enable macros to view the document. The original malicious link was emailed to victims so that when they clicked it, they would be taken to the UPS website serving the Word document. Here's a reconstruction of what it probably looked like for this attacker to find this cross-site scripting vulnerability. Don't get caught in the mosh pits Fuel to the fire, ain't nobody can stop it Trouble in my city, but you know I'm across it Got a 40 on my hip and I'm liable to spark it Throw down these hits, my click is indivisible I aim, you duck, I squeeze, now you invisible I'm not afraid of getting physical All these different chemicals are fogging up my visuals Bloods on my hands, got slugs on my gunners Yo, we Okay, so this doesn't answer the question, why don't we see more attacks like this in the wild? Well, let's start with the vulnerability discovery process. While the vulnerability is searched for, a server is logging every cross-site scripting attempt, including the full URL payload, which is pretty typical for server logs. These server logs tell a story of which IP address the attacker used, what times of day they were testing, what user agent they were testing with, and more. Next, the goal for the attacker was to get the victim to click a link and browse to the UPS website to download this Word document. Would it materially have matched Mattered that much if the link was to ups.com or ups-delivery.co, which is a domain presently available for purchase for $8. The attacker might have even gotten away with just attaching the Word document directly to the original phishing email without the need to click on a link at all. Using cross-site scripting in this case decreased the attacker's operational security and gave UPS a trail of breadcrumbs to figure out what happened. That's not to say you can't do a lot of damage with cross-site scripting. It's just often easier for an attacker to send out a phishing email or obtain stolen credentials from a third party, and the easier route is often the safer route. You can check out a talk I gave last year on using cross-site scripting to attack infrastructure. Link in the description. Maybe someday these attacks will become more common, but for now they mostly remain on BugCrowd and HackerOne, and the occasional panache-filled UPS hacker. If you want to see more videos like this, share this video and consider subscribing.